My name is Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at, at uh, Washington State University. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this year's Thomas S. Foley Distinguished Lecture, which will be given by Paul Pearson. Before I introduce our speaker, I just want to say a little bit about the Foley Institute and recognize some of our distinguished guests in the audience. The Foley Institute was established at WSU in 1995 to honor the service of Thomas S. Foley, including 30 years representing the citizens of the 5th Congressional District in Washington, as well as his service as Speaker of the United States House of Representatives and his service as Ambassador to Japan. Although Mr. Foley passed away in 2013, we are honored to have with us tonight Heather Foley, who, in addition to being Mr. Foley's wife, served as his unpaid chief of staff for many years. She flew in from Washington, D.C. yesterday, and we are delighted to welcome her back to WSU. I also wish uh, to acknowledge the generous support that the Foley Institute receives from the College of Arts and Sciences. And we are uh, uh, pleased to have with us today uh, Dean Daryl DeWald, who is also in the audience. The institute that bears Mr. Foley's name continues his great legacy of statesmanship, integrity, and commitment to public service through a variety of programs that educate the public about American democracy and encourages young people to pursue careers in public service. The Institute uh, does a lot of exciting things at WSU and around the state, and if you'd like to know more about us, I encourage you to visit our website or like us on Facebook, and you'll receive information about our future programs and events. The Foley Distinguished Lecture Series recognizes Mr. Foley's belief that the critical challenges we face in the 21st century can only be met through innovative, informed, and civil dialogue. Some of our previous distinguished lecturers have included such luminaries as the former uh, Governor of Vermont and DNC Chair Howard Dean, New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof, former U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft, the former President of the NAACP, Kwesi Nfume, and political scholars such as Morris Friarina and accomplished writers and social commentators like Christopher Hitchens and Chris Hedges. Tonight's distinguished lecture comes at a particularly important time in American political history, and it also serves as a keynote for a series that the Foley Institute is hosting around the new presidency of Donald Trump. One can say, I think without any hyperbole, that the transition we are currently witnessing between the outgoing presidency of Barack Obama and the incoming presidency of Donald Trump is as stark as any in recent memory, probably going back at least to 1932 in the transition between Hubert Hoover and Fra uh, Franklin Roosevelt. That change is embodied both in the character and persona of the two men something that's very important given how personalized our presidency is, but also in the first 10 days of this new administration, the sharp and abrupt policy changes that have been taking place. Those changes have left many Americans feeling disoriented, some cheering, others protesting. What are we to make of them? What explains the rise of Donald Trump's populist and nationalist appeals? And what does it portend for the future of our country? Fortunately for us, I can think of no better person to help bring some perspective to these developments than our speaker tonight. Paul Pearson is the John Gross Endowed Chair of Political Science at the University of California at Berkeley. From 2007 to 2010, Paul also served as the Chair of the Department of Political Science there, and prior to that, he taught at Harvard University. A native of Eugene, Oregon, where both his parents were uh, academics, he graduated with a BA in government from Oberlin College and then went to Yale University where he received his PhD. His first book, Dismantling the Welfare State, won the American Political Science Association's prize for the best work on American national politics in 1994. His journal article, Increasing Returns, Path Dependence, and the Study of Politics, won the Heinz Eula Award for the best paper published in the American Political Science Review in 2000. In 2010, his book, um, uh, Winner Take All Politics, it was published uh, uh, with uh, Jacob Hacker, was a New York Times bestseller. Their most recent book, America Amnesia, published last, last year by Simon & Schuster, has received widespread critical acclaim. In it, they argue for the reinvigoration of the United States' mixed ec economic model as a way to restore prosperity and a more functioning government. 
While Paul Pearson's work on American public policy and political economy is insightful and provocative, what made me immediately think of him as tonight's keynote speaker to kick off our series on the Trump administration is his more theoretical work on how we best understand political change. In his groundbreaking 2004 book, Politics and Time, Pearson presented the most systematic examination to date of the often invoked but rarely examined declaration that history matters. Most political pundits and commentators and even many political scientists and social scientists unconsciously take a snapshot view of the political world. But the meaning of social and political events become disoriented when they are ripped from their temporal contexts. Pearson argues that placing politics in time or constructing moving pictures rather than snapshots of political events is the only way we can understand the complex dynamics of political change and why, when, and how change occurs. So please join me now in welcoming to WSU, Paul Pearson. Thanks, thanks Cornell for that, that nice introduction. Um, it's great to be here. Um, first time in Pullman. Uh, though Pullman has long been on my radar screen, because I grew up in Eugene and uh, remember many sad years in what was then the Pac-8 um, when we were locked with Washington State in that battle for seventh place. Um, so uh, anyway, it's good to, good to finally be here. Um, and I want to thank the Fo Foley Institute and, and Cornell and everybody else who's been involved in organizing this this visit, and uh, really, it's been an enormous honor for me to um, to meet Teresa Foley this this uh, last couple of days. Um, and I, I think you'll see as I get as I get into the talk today that it's a, a real honor for me to be giving these remarks as a, as a Foley lecture um, in in memory of his contribution to American politics. Because I'm I'm going to actually I am going to sort of invoke putting the current moment in time, um, mostly by looking back and thinking about what's happened over the last 25 or 30 years in American politics. Uh, and I, I think that um, the ending of Tom Foley's distinguished political career uh, made him one of the first victims of the kind of political dynamics that I want to highlight uh, in, my, in my remarks tonight. Uh, it has been a long political year. Uh, and for, for my household, probably like a lot of households, a lot of it played out in the kitchen where the family gathers over, getting, getting the meal prepared and the speakers are blaring and there was a lot of politics coming out of the uh, speakers, a perplexing spectacle. My teenage kids for the first time in their lives became riveted by an extraordinary political story. The rise of a most improbable outsider to the national stage the clash of outsized political ambitions, sex scandals, accusations of foreign intrigue splashed across the nation's newspapers, intense, brutal, partisan warfare over the highest stakes. I'm talking, of course, about the Broadway sensation Hamilton. Now, Hamilton famously and profanely starts with the question, how does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by Providence, impoverished in squalor, grew up to be a hero and a scholar. And today, with many apologies, I want to ask a version of that question to start off for Donald Trump, a man who 61% of those asked in exit polls at the election said was not qualified to be president of the United States, 61%. How does a grifter, a hater, an ignorant debater, a man with no knowledge who stiffs folks want in college, come to be for 60 million, the tribune of the hour, just one lucky break from awesome power? Party of Lincoln, what were you thinking? So Lin-Manuel Miranda's initial answer is kind of a Horatio Alger answer. Right? It's about the individual qualities of the man. The $10 founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder, by being a lot smarter, by being a self-starter. And as they add later on in the chorus, another immigrant coming from the bottom. Um, but I'm not going to offer any more 
rhymes, um, nor do I want to offer any kind of individualized account of where we, where we went on a road that led us to President Trump. Uh, instead, I want to think about some of the structural fe features of the politics of the last 30 years that have generated this outcome. Now, in thinking about this, I think we face two intellectual dangers. The first is to normalize what happened. Right? And I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of pressure on, a lot of pe people feel drawn to kind of normalize it, to treat it as just like this is just a routine or relatively routine despite some of the eccentric features of it, a kind of ch changing of the guard, right? Just another turn of the electoral cycle following well-practiced rituals of cabinet appointments, legislative agendas, and before too long, the next presidential campaign. Now, and this is a vision of politics. It's one that my co-author Jacob Hacker and I have, have critiqued criti uh, repeatedly. We call it thinking about American politics as spectacle um, that basically sees elections as the main show and treats them sort of like sporting events. Right. Presidential elections are the Super Bowl of politics, but basically you just keep cycling through one election to the ne next. Uh, without too much happening. And, and there's a lot, of, if you see some of the, I think particularly if you watch TV news, you see a lot of effort to try to push what's been going on into that normal, root, routinized vision of American politics. There's a second danger though, right? And that is to abnormalize what has happened, to treat it as a fluke. Right? Meteor hurtling towards her Earth that most of the time would have just flown by, but for a variety of sort of fluky reasons, this time it didn't. But I think using either approach, the one that treats it as totally normal or the one who treats it, that treats it as a fluke, neither of them does justice to really thinking about what's happened to, our Ameri to American politics over the last 30 years that made it possible for somebody who 61% of the voters said wasn't qualified um, to become president. A person who I think, frankly, um, uh, could not have become president uh, at any time uh, in uh, past American history up until the last few years. So we need to think structurally about what's been going on. And I want to start by saying that, frankly, I don't think American political scientists, including myself, are all that well equipped for addressing that challenge. Our discipline's much better at analyzing why some aspects of politics today might be a little different uh, than the way things looked yesterday. Um, we're not good at analyzing what I've called big, slow-moving processes. Right? Things that are changing gradually over a long period of time. We're not good at trying to understand why 2016 is different from 1992, is different from 1972. And I think we're also, as a discipline, getting worse at thinking configurationally. That is about how different parts of the political system or of broader social relationships fit together to make certain things possible uh, at particular points in time. And in a few minutes, I want to focus on what I think is a fundamental aspect of our new configuration, which is the way in which core features of our separation of powers constitution interact with long-term transformations in our party system, and in particular, the long-term transformation of the Republican Party. Political scientists have a lot to do to figure this out, and I think this election should be a wake-up call uh, for those who try to study politics for a living. And a wake-up call not because we missed the outcome by one or two percent, like there's a lot of discussion about how the polls could get it wrong. Actually, the polls didn't get it that wrong. Right? They got it a little bit wrong. Arguably, they got it a little bit wrong because there were some pretty eventful things happening in the last few days of the campaign that they missed by just a little bit, but it turned out that that miss was decisive. Now, before I go uh, all omniscient on you, I should say that in a, the book that Jacob and I published last March, we talked essentially not at all about Donald Trump. And that was partly because um, we didn't want the book to be focused on just what's going on this year. We wanted it to have a broader sweep. But obviously, if we were to rewrite that book now, we would write it in a somewhat different way. But I, I say that just because I think that all of us in trying to figure out what has happened and what's likely to happen next, we should be a little humble about it. Right? 
I don't know, I think I know maybe one political scientist who eight months ago thought that there was a good chance that Donald Trump would become president. Okay. I, know a lot, I, I know way too many political scientists, so one is not a very big number. All right. So I want to say just a little bit about trying to think about this, these broader structural changes that I referred to. And my list, you can make this endlessly complicated, but my list would have five items on it. Um, three of them I'm not going to talk about at all, except just to kind of acknowledge them and say I'm not going to talk about them. Um, and partly I do that because I think a lot of other people are talking about these things. Right? And you need to, to build them into, I think, a, a full understanding of what's going on. But I got a limited amount of time, and so I want to talk about things that I think are actually not getting as much attention uh, as they should and, and that are profoundly important and that also, I think, help us to understand where we're likely to be going, not just where we've been. Okay, so let's quickly, the three things that I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the broad and uh, very difficult wrenching economic changes that the United States has gone through after the over the last 40 years, right, um, which involve um, essentially wage stagnation for huge chunks of, Amer of American society, uh, particularly those without, college, without a college education, also involve a, a huge increase in inequality with more and more of income gains going to people at the very top of the income distribution rather than being spread widely. I'm not going to talk about the second big transformation, which is profound demographic change. The U.S. moving towards a, major a majority minority country. Now, the political significance of both of these big shifts is, I think, tightly connected to the fundamental role of race and place. Race and place, that's where people live. There are huge growing divides in American politics based on where people live. Uh, those, so the economic and demographic change are connected to the fundamental role of race and place in shaping contemporary American politics and certainly this presidential campaign brought that to the fore. I'm not going to talk about any of that. The third structural factor that I'm not going to talk about is the transformation of the media. Uh, and actually, there are a bunch of subtopics there that people that you would want to talk about. We need an analysis of the long-term consequences of media transformation. The way that people get information, and maybe air quotes are appropriate here, the way that people get information um, has changed dramatically um, over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, and, we, and so political scientists, I would say, need to spend less time thinking about What's the effect on my uh, opinions, views on issues, knowledge, if I watch a uh, show on Fox? And ask instead, what's the effect if I spend 10 or 15 or 20 years uh, watching Fox on a regular basis and also being saturated by talk radio? Right. Those are different questions. Um, and we also, I think, would need to spend some time thinking about the diminishing attention to the substance of governing uh, that the mainstream media uh, provides. Right? Less and less attention to the actual policy stakes that are involved in making choices about who is going to govern. I think that's probably highly consequential too, but I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the evolution of the Republican Party, and I'm going to talk about its interaction with the structure of the American Constitution. And I want to argue, and I want to suggest that that's had a big effect on the nature of our politics, uh, and one that helps to make it clearer how you could get um, a Donald Trump. Okay. So first, let me talk about the modern Republican Party a little bit. Along with Jacob Hacker, I was an early adopter of the view that has come to be called within political science asymmetric polarization asymmetric polarization, right? broad recognition that the increasing polarization between the parties has been a fundamental change in our politics, but the claim that we were making was that the growing distance between the parties and the rise of scorched earth politics primarily results from changes on the Republican side. Right? That's not to say that the Democrats don't have anything to do with it, but it's to say that it's primarily a result of change on the Republican side. 
Now, this view is best encapsulated in one of the most widely quoted passages in recent work on American politics, uh, Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein's It's Even Worse Than It Looks, right? a book that was published in 2012 by two longtime and very mainstream observers of Congress in uh, Washington think tanks. And I'll read that passage. The Republican Party, they wrote, has become an insurgent outlier in American politics, ideologically extreme, contemptuous of the inherited social and economic policy regime, scornful of compromise, unmoved by conventional understandings of facts, evidence, and science, and dismissive of the legitimacy of its political opposition. Now, as an early member of the Asymmetric Polarization Club, I can tell you we used to hold our meetings in phone booths. You guys remember phone booths? Yeah, right. Now our meetings are pretty popular, um, and I think for pretty good reason. So even though I was pretty early on a skeptic of what political scientists call the median voter theorem, right, which is the idea that the voter in the middle of the distribution of ideological positions is the crucial swing voter, and that the parties face enormous pressure to converge like they did in the 1950s when people said Tweedledee and Tweedledum about the parties, right? They're the same, basically, you know, very close to being the same. Now, I, I've long been skeptical about that theory, which, which one of the things that that theory always suggested was that parties would be punished if they moved away from the center. Right. So even though I was skeptical about it, though, I've been astonished at every step by the unremitting radicalization of Republicans over the past 30 years. That man, Ornstein, quote, which I think used to provoke dismissive scorn from many mainstream political scientists, no longer sounds all that polemical. It's merely descriptive. After every lost presidential election, Republicans faced calls to moderate. You know, and remember, so in 2000, for example, they, they lost the popular vote, even though they, um, they won the Electoral College. Um, but despite those calls for moderation, each time they actually became even more conservative. What has driven um, that radicalization and helped to make uh, a Donald Trump possible? Well, one place to start, there's a recent book called, uh, catchily, Asymmetric Politics uh, by the political scientists Daniel Hopkins and Matt Grossman. Um, very smart book, important book, I think worth reading, uh, which really zeroes in on the attitudes of voters. And it says it reviews lots of public opinion re research that suggests, you know, actually there are pretty significant differences between Republican and Democratic voters. The modern GOP, they say, is what they call an ideologically grounded mass party, right? Primed to view politics as a clash of principles or worldviews in which compromise is suspect, right, if not immoral. So Republicans, they find when they do survey, uh, research, you know, they're much more likely to identify core ideological principles like freedom as being central to their thinking about politics, where the, whereas Democrats are much more likely to rattle off a bunch of issue positions. Right. So what they say basically is Democrats are more like a coalition of interests, Republicans more like uh, an ideologically principle-grounded party. Now, I think there's something to this. I said, I think it's impor important to read, and I think those differences in opinion are real. So, for example, you ask survey questions about whether you think politicians should compromise, and Democrats are much more likely to say that they should compromise than Republicans are. But, it, but this kind of analysis, I think, is way too um, bottom-up and not enough top-down, right? It says a lot about voters and their views, but it doesn't say very much about the constellation of interests and organizations that helps to give parties shape over time. It understates, for example, the role of um, uh, powerful interest groups, especially within a transformed business community and among the wealthy. So in my recent book with Jacob, we talk a lot about uh, the really startling, startling rightward and partisan shift of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, and the development of this extraordinary uh, Koch Brothers Network, um, which um, 
now has resources that, pu that put it essentially on a scale of a, of a traditional political party. Uh, this kind of bottom-up analysis also downplays the prominent role of right-wing media, which faces very powerful incentives to stoke outrage and direct that outrage in particular directions. So my account would shift the balance from a bottom-up approach to more of a uh, top-down appro uh, top approach. But I think there's also another vital piece of the puzzle, right? It's not just that you have powerful interests and a, and a right-wing media for which there really is no parallel on the left. I mean, there really is nothing remotely equivalent to talk radio in terms of its scale and partisan in intensity on the other side of the, of the political divide. Uh, I think there's another piece of the puzzle that we don't pay enough attention to, and I want to zero in on that. Um, in today's environment, our core political institutions don't just tolerate asymmetric polarization, they actually encourage it. Right, here's the claim that I want to make, that our Constitution is partly to blame. Right. Now, most Americans are blissfully unaware that we have very unusual political institutions. Presidential systems are actually pretty uncommon if you look, uh, if you look cross-nationally at the countries that have democracies. Most Americans, I think, probably think, well, other countries must have, if they don't, if they haven't actually studied it, they think, well, other countries probably more or less copied what we did, but they actually, most countries didn't. Right? Most countries adopted parliamentary systems, right? um, and most of them don't have uh, presidents, or at least not presidents that are more than a figurehead. So presidentialism is pretty uncommon. Two-party presidentialism, right, so a system that has a president and only two major parties, that's almost vanishingly rare. I asked the Stanford political scientist Jonathan Rodden about this, and he told me there are four cases. The U.S., Ghana, the Philippines, and Sierra Leone. Right. The United States is the only affluent democracy that combines presidentialism with single-member districts with winner-take-all legislative elections, right. which strongly encourages two parties because you don't get, there's no prize for second place. So why should we care about this, all right? We're unusual. Well, the great political sociologist Juan Lentz, long ago, mostly from studying Latin America, right, raised concerns that presidentialism increased the prospects for a democracy breaking down. Why did he think that? Well, he said because it creates two possibilities that are dangerous. Right? One possibility is that you can have polarized, divided government in which each side controlled part of the government and had a basic claim to, claim to legitimacy. Right, so in a parliamentary system, you can't get a clash, really, right, between a, a durable clash between an executive, legitimate executive, and a, and a legitimate leg legislature. Because if you can't command a parliamentary majority, you can't stay prime minister. So the idea that you could, what we call divided government, which has been the norm in American politics uh, over the last 30 years or so, really over the, la over the last 40 years, that's, that, it's unsustainable in a parliamentary system. So you can't, so that kind of increasing tension that we, I think, have witnessed, you know, especially since 2010, so the, the, the last six years of the Obama administration, but it was already pretty familiar to us by that point, um, that's not gonna happen. Uh, in a durable way in a, in a parliamentary system, and certainly not one without a president. And then there's a second danger that he mentioned, which was that presidentialism increased the prospect of a demagogue outsider gaining power. That was the second danger he was worried about. So if you scan the international news, you can see some of the di dynamics that I've just talked about in play. Venezuela teeters on the brink with conflict between a president and Congress controlled by warring parties. In Brazil, the elected president is removed through what was, what was essentially a legislative coup in which the dominant coalition in the legislature substituted a president more to their liking and then initiated a set of policy shifts that made the ambitions of Paul Ryan look like an exercise in Eisenhower Republicanism. In the Philippines, a demagogue takes power. In South Korea, the legislature launches a vigorous assault on an unpopular president. Now, all of that international news 
historically would have been seen to be of limited relevance to the United States. And Linz himself pointed this out at the time. He spent a bunch of time talking about why it was that the U.S. didn't seem to be falling vulnerable to any of these uh, dangers associated with presidentialism. And he gave a very clear answer to this question. He said, well, the reason is because the U.S. is different in one vital respect. The U.S. has weak and decentralized political parties. Weak and decentralized political parties. Our parties, those Tweedledee, Tweedledum parties that I was talking about before, they're very loose coalitions. Right? People have the labels attached, you know, Will Rogers. I was in Oklahoma City last week at Will Rogers Airport, I guess the only airport in the country named for somebody who died in a plane crash. Um, Will Rogers famously said once, um, I'm a member of no organized political party. I'm a Democrat. Right? Um, and you know, back in, back in the old days, that was what our parties looked like. They were pretty disorganized. They were pretty loose, loose coalitions, which meant that a president, even if they were in a minority in Congress, there were lots of opportunities for wheeling and dealing, right? There were lots of opportunities to find members of the other party. You could reach across the aisle and you could, e either because they, given the area that they represented, they shared some common concern with you, and so you could build different coalitions on different, on different issues uh, with people from different parts of the country, whether they were in your party or not. You know, and sometimes you also, you had a little bit of pork that you could use to make that deal possible. Right? But either way, you know, and this was true, I would say the end point is 1990. I actually think 1990 is the end point, right? That's the end point where you get sort of the last big bipartisan agreements between a Republican president, George H.W. Bush, and Democratic majorities, uh, and, and producing some big, some big important bipartisan legislation, the Clean Air Act amendments, Americans with Disabilities Act, a big deficit reduction agreement that involved compromises on both sides. All that used to happen, and Lynn said, well, that, that aspect of American politics, that our parties are so decentralized and weak, uh, means that the government doesn't get into these kinds of intense, you don't get this intense warfare uh, between Congress and the presidency. Okay. Well, that, that description of American politics hopefully sounds a little antiquated to you because that's not the way it works now. Right. Our system, Jacob and I have written, our system used to require compromise, separations of powers, checks and balances, but it also facilitated compromise. Right? It required compromise, but it facilitated compromise because the parties were weak and you could deal across the aisle and form coalitions. 30 years or so ago, that began to change. Our system still required compromise most of the time, but it no longer facilitated it. Right? The result is a new and dangerous form of American exceptionalism one that has allowed a party to be simultaneously in the political system and against the political system. To be at the same time a party of government and an anti-system party. Right? That's something that's not really possible in a parliamentary system. Right? You're either in or, or you're out. You're either the majority or you don't have any power. Right? But in American politics, it's a little different. So what's been happening over the last three or four decades. And you can, you can time the origins of this uh, uh, differently. There, you, know, you can keep drawing it further back if you want to. Polarization in the U.S. by most measures begins to grow in the early to mid-1970s. Um, but I think, it, I'm going to suggest in a minute, it really intensifies in the 1990s. What's happened? Well, U.S. parties became more unified and more national. I grew up in Oregon where there were a lot of moderate to liberal Republicans. Right? Oregon Republicans looked pretty different from, I don't know, um, an Illinois Republican or a Virginia Republican. Now they look a lot more alike, right? and they vote a lot more alike. They're supported by a lot of the same folks, especially powerful organized interests that now pump millions and millions of dollars into campaigns all across the country. Right? And the smaller your state is in population, the higher proportion of the money that's feeding into your campaign is coming from out of state from these groups. Right? 
And those interest groups increasingly, for good reason, they see their interests as best guaranteed not by working across the aisle, but by, hope, by helping the party that is on their side get over the top. Right? Lots and lots of groups used to work both sides. Right? Now, w pretty much Wall Street is the only one that still does that. Because they're, so, they they're so rich, they feel like they can do pretty well. They can do pretty well both ways. But virtually everybody else, they pick the side. Even something like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, again, the story, this is one of the stories that we tell in American Amnesia. U.S. Chamber of Commerce was a pretty, it's always been a conservative organization. Um, but it worked pretty well on lots of occasions with Democrats as well as Republicans. Uh, and it didn't engage in a lot of partisan warfare. Now, and now it does. Right, now it does. Um, now m much of the political leadership of the Chamber of Commerce involves people who have moved straight over from positions in the Republican National Committee um, or from Republican administrations to work for the Chamber. Because they think they're going to do better under Republicans than they're going to do under Democrats. They want, they want Republicans to nominate the swing vote on the Supreme Court. They don't want a Democrat to do that. So, uh, so all the interest groups are choosing sides. Politics becomes nationalized. Another big factor that you probably have, have uh, read about, most members sit in safe seats. People often talk about gerrymandering, but a lot of this is actually not driven by ger gerrymandering. We could talk about that in the Q&A if, if you want. It's true in the Senate as well as the House, and there's no gerrymandering except the original gerrymandering uh, that, that went into the U.S. Senate. It's just most, most places, people are chosen in a particular place, and most places in the U.S. they look pretty red or pretty blue in a way that hasn't always been true. And so what does that mean? It means that the people who are in those safe seats, their biggest danger to re-election comes in a primary. Their incentives to compromise, very, very limited. If you're a Republican member of Congress, probably the worst thing that could happen to you in terms of your electoral prospects would be to have somebody take a picture of you shaking hands with Barack Obama. Fatal. Okay, so folks are in safe seats where they don't want to compromise. Parties are becoming unified and national. These incentives, Jacob and I have argued, are, in, are considerably stronger on the Republican side than they are on the Democratic side. They're at work on both sides, and actually I think they're getting stronger on the Democratic side than they have been. But part of the reason why we say polarization is asymmetric um, is because we think these forces have been stronger on the Republican side. Some of that has to do with rising inequality. Right? So business and the wealthy have become more powerful in American politics. That makes it easy for Republicans to, to move to the left. It actually pulls them to the, I mean to the right, pulls them to the right in a lot of ways. Democrats at cross pressures. Right? They've got unions and business that they have to make happy. And they're trying and they're they're pushing in both directions by that. That's an important development in American politics, but it's not one that pushes uh, pushes Democrats to the left. But Republicans have moved consistently to the right on a lot of the key issues dividing the parties, having to do with regulation, taxes, social programs, and so on. Another reason why we think it's different on the right is because of the intensity of right-wing media and its tight connection to the Republican Party. There are tight connections to the party uh, within right-wing media. Um, Steve Matt Bannon just moved from Breitbart to the pinnacle of the White House. There's nothing comparable on the left, which is not the same thing as saying that there aren't a lot of liberals in the media, because there are. Right? But, that, but there's nothing like the intensity and connection directly into party politics um, that, that exists within Fox News or um, talk radio. Uh, so also, another force pushing towards extremism is the no compromise tenor that, uh, that exists in Republican discourse, and that's the point that I mentioned earlier that uh, Matt Grossman and, and Dave Hopkins have made. Right. The GOP's more ideological appeals feed intransigence, feed a sense um, that survival is at stake. And then the last factor that I want to mention um, that I think is important and is one that's often not, not recognized is that the, the dysfunction and gridlock 
and brutal warfare um, that has been affecting Washington, you know, really for the last 30 years, um, but certainly the last six years that we, that we witnessed, it's actually not neutral between the parties in this effect. On balance, it benefits the anti-government party. Right? It's not neutral between the parties. It benefits the anti-government party. And therefore, that, that's why I want to suggest that while both parties have things to answer for in the way that things have evolved, the Republicans have been the ones who have been primarily pushing it because they have much stronger incentives to push it. They benefit from people's sense that Washington is a cesspool. There's a central, if largely unrecognized, paradox of this political moment. Uh, I don't think I've seen anybody make this comment yet, but it probably just means I haven't read enough. Congress has never been less popular. Right. Well, maybe a few percentage points, right? But Congress is consistently now in the low teens in its approval ratings, right? And was in 2015 and 2016. And yet voters just handed enormous power to those who have been running Congress. I don't think they really thought much about that that was what they were doing, but that's, what, that's in effect what they've done. And here we must turn to the enduring insight of the great political philosopher, Newt Gingrich, who realized that gridlock dysfunction and partisan rancor were not neutral. Right. On balance, they benefit powerful Republican constituencies because they limit government activism. Right? If you tie government up in knots, many, many Republican constituencies are going to be happy with that. And even if gridlock dysfunction and rancor damage the Republican brand, they damage the pro-government party more, undercutting the core of its case to rule. And then the problem becomes even more intensified as over the last, over the period since the early 1990s, as Republicans became more the dominant party in Congress, while Democrats became the party more, uh, better place to win the presidency. Because in addition to the fact that pro-government parties are more likely to suffer from people's disgust with Washington than anti-government parties, the party that controls, that controls the presidency is also going to be seen as most responsible. Right. Even if that party doesn't actually, even if the president doesn't actually control what's happening in Washington. Right. Even if they can't get any of their legislative agenda through Congress, even if they can't even get their people appointed by Congress. Gingrich's ideas were refined and extended by another great political philosopher, Mitch McConnell. And together, I would say, so you might think naturally, if you're thinking about the modern Republican Party, that the, that the, the key, uh, you know, the, the, the most prominent position on the Republican Mount Rushmore should go to Ronald Reagan. And I can see why people would want to put it, put it that way. I think the most prominent position should go to uh, Newt Gingrich and Mitch McConnell. Uh, as a game theorist would put it, bipartisanship and compromise were no longer incentive compatible for Republicans. Right. Wasn't compatible with their incentives to engage in bipartisanship. Uh, instead, what was incentive compatible was to ramp up contempt for government, in part by attributing malevolence to your opponents. Now, as I said before, I think Tom Foley was one of the first political victims of this change uh, in our politics. It's a nice quote I found from Dan Coats, who was in the House as Gingrich was rising to power and developing these arguments about how basically you had to make people thoroughly disgusted by Washington um, in order uh, for Republicans to gain the ma majority. And as, as Coates put it a little later, a Gingrich operated with the belief that to ultimately succeed, you almost had to destroy the system so that you could rebuild it. It was, as Coates put it, kind of scary stuff. Right. Quickly, just a few greatest hits. Um, and here again, the, you know, what I really want to stress is we need a historical approach. We need to remember, right, that this didn't all start yesterday. It's been going on for a long time. Multiple government shutdowns. A massively unpopular impeachment of a sitting president. Holding the full faith and credit of the U.S. Treasury hostage in order to force policy concessions. 
Refusal to even consider a president's nominees for key positions effect effectively making it impossible for agencies that were authorized by law to function. And then extending that refusal to a blockade of what would have been the decisive vote on the Supreme Court. Not just, not just happening in Congress, beyond Congress, decades of efforts to roll back voting rights justified with baseless, and I mean baseless, accusations of fraud. Accusations that advanced partisan goals by feeding racial animosities and nurturing fundamental doubts about the legit legitimacy of American elections and the Republicans' opponents. The exuberant embrace by the party of Sarah Palin, who was Trump before Trump. The encouragement of birtherism, a sustained effort to delegitimate the nation's first African-American president as some kind of foreigner. Republican voters have been primed for 25 years to accept a wide range of anti-system arguments, including many of the arguments that were deployed and amplified effectively by our new president. Now, in pointing to the interplay between our constitutional structure, right, the separation of powers system which allows multiple sites of authority, and the evolution of the GOP, I'm only focusing, like I said before, at two of the pieces of the puzzle of trying to understand how we came to have a President Trump. There are lots of other important parts of the story, and it's worth talking about, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about um, what it would mean to bring some of these other considerations in, in, into, uh, into play. But I want to close by saying just a little bit about what it means for our understanding of contemporary politics. I want to just quickly suggest three uh, implications of the analysis that I've offered. Now, one of them is retrospective and the other two are prospective. The retrospective point is that Trump is figuratively Frankenstein's monster. I say figuratively because some, a discussion in the uh, Goldberg Pearson kitchen the other night was that we were tired of people saying literally when they meant figuratively. And so we decided that we were going to fairly regularly say figuratively when we meant figuratively, right? just to push back. Right? Trump is figuratively Frankenstein's monster. He's not literally Frankenstein's monster. He's the outgrowth of a politics of anti-system rage that has been stoked on the right for a generation a political strategy that core features of the American political design permit and indeed encourage. Okay. Now here are two prospective points. And this gets us towards having a conversation about what's going on now and what's likely to be going on. Okay. So to an extent that would not be true of right-wing populisms elsewhere, Trump's populism overlaps with a deeply entrenched and well-organized establishment. So this is th something that I'm incre increasingly fascinated by when because there is a, a broad cross-national phenomenon here, right? There are connections, similarities between what's happening in continental Europe, Brexit, and Trump's election. Right? Um, but Trump is connected part because of our constitutional structure and because of the story that I've been talking about to a, a congressional Republican status, uh, a congressional Republican party that is already in place and has been in place for quite a while and has a long list of things that they want to do. Uh, and in many cases, Congress will be setting the agenda. Right? They're the ones who are gonna legislate. And then a President Trump will be left with the choice of either signing that legislation or not. And he's already put a number of figures from that congressional majority uh, in, his, in key cabinet positions in a way that suggests, at least to me, that he's going to be quite willing to sign an awful lot of that legislation if it reaches his desk. So Trump and the establishment, or as he called it during the campaign, the swamp, right, are joined at the hip. Okay. Second perspective point. That Republican machine is well designed for gaining office. Okay. I think we're already seeing that it may be less well suited to the task of governing. Okay. The Affordable Care Act where having had, 
how many years? Six years? Seven years? To figure out what they would do if they were in a position to introduce uh, new health care policy. I think we're already seeing that they're finding it's a lot more difficult to actually design such a policy than it is uh, to simply say that you hate the one that's there. Some people have used the metaphor, the dog has caught the car. Right. So we're going to find out, right, what happens when an anti-system party has unified control of the government and is now placed in a position where they have to decide uh, what the laws are going to be. So those are three implications, and with respect to that last question, what are they going to do? I have to say I'm not especially looking forward to finding out. Thank you. Okay, so we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers, and we have two microphones on either side, so I'm going to encourage you to get up and walk to one of those two microphones, and we'll, take, we'll, we'll uh, alternate back and forth. Uh, perhaps I'll start off with a question. I'm, I find very appealing your argument about uh, constitutional structures and their role in, in creating uh, the, the Trump phenomena. However, I want to go back and push a little bit on the, the question about uh, the transnational nature of populism and nationalism that's taking place at, you know, certainly throughout uh, Western Europe right now. Um, so, so, so how does that fit into your argument, the fact that we're seeing this similar phenomenon? And, and it can't be just that they're tied to the establishment, because I think you can make a similar argument about what's going on with uh, the Conservative Party in England, for instance, or perhaps even the Conservatives uh, in France right now with Le Pen. So take it away. Yeah, it's a great, great question, um, and one that I'm still puzzling over. Right. So, so the first thing I would say is I do, I do think there is a trans, transnational phenomenon at work. Um, and it's related to it at least two, if not the first three structural factors that I mentioned. You know, really profound economic change that has been especially difficult for people who um, don't have a college education, right, or who are located in parts of the country where economic opportunities seem to be limited. Now, it, you know, that often gets, so that, that produces attitudes that are broadly anti-global anti -global and anti-elite, even though I think a lot of the economic research suggests that trade is a relatively modest factor compared with technological change in, dri in driving many of these economic developments. But they are big, they are big powerful, disruptive, anxiety-producing, anger-producing changes, right? And they're not, they're not limited to the U.S. And the same is true with demographic change. Right, though it plays out differently in, in, in different places. If you're a country that's used to, if, if you're white in a country that has been dominated by whites, right, uh, numerically and politically, right, and that is changing and it's changing rapidly, there's a lot of reason to think that that's going to cause, that, that, that that's going to exacerbate uh, other tensions and you know, significantly intensify other, other tensions and give them a, partic a particular kind of form. And then the media changes are also cross-national. Right? So I agree, I agree with, with all of that. Uh, but I do think, what, what I'm trying to suggest is that our constitutional structure and the way that it interacts with the party system right, has a big effect on how this, how this plays out. And, and that's true, I think, in a couple of ways. After the election's over, it plays out because Donald Trump doesn't govern by himself. This, his movement, his electoral coalition doesn't govern by itself. They govern in combination with congressional Republicans, many of whom, even though they're, they are eventually going to have to rely on, on many of the same base voters, but they've been in there for a while. They're connected a lot of powerful interest groups. They really have quite different ideas and important areas about what, what needs to be a priority and what policy should look like, and they're going to be able to pursue that. And that's different than would be true in these other countries. But also, before the election, the way that I think that it shows up, look, the, the fact that 60%, 61% of voters said that they didn't think Donald Trump was qualified to be president suggests something about the size of that base coalition. Right? But what happens is in the U.S. system with our two-party system and a presidential election is that once he gets the nomination, once he gets the nomination, most Republicans ended up voting for him. Right? They stuck with their party. 
even though he wasn't their choice. And I think that was like, if you wanted to go back and relitigate that campaign and think about it, as we did actually at dinner last night, um, you know, the, the Clinton campaign basically was based on the strategy that, you know, Trump is going to be so unappealing to a significant portion of the Republican electorate, the more the college educated, sub suburban, more cosmopolitan parts of the Republican electorate, went, significant groups of women, that he may gain some votes with these appeals that he's making, but he's going to lose a ton of votes too. And our job is to provide a non-threatening alternative and mostly just turn his words against him, right? So all of Clinton's ads, you know, the bulk of Clinton's ads were just, here's some video of Donald Trump talking, you know, and their view was, you know, a bunch of Republican voters are going to peel off. And they were wrong. I mean, some did, but very, but, you know, not nearly enough, not nearly as many as they expected. And that was because in a highly, po now we're in this highly polarized, system where people either identify themselves as being on the red team or the blue team, and they were um, led to embrace the argument that however concerned they might be about Donald Trump, that Hillary Clinton was much worse, and that stopping her was much worse. And for red voters, that was a very persuasive argument. And so 90% of Republicans voted for Donald Trump. Um, so I do have a question about the Electoral College yeah. So you talked about it earlier at how the rep uh, the same scenario in 2000 just repeated in 2016 with the uh, 2017 with the elections. So uh, my question is, what does it take to change a system uh, system of voting that hasn't been changed sin since George Washington, and do you see it possibly happening or not? Well, I I I do actually. So so this now so a, no a normative judgment. I mean, I. I, I do I do think that the Electoral College is a hard institution to defend and by any political theory that you know why why you would want to create a situation where and now it's happened twice and in, in 16 years the person who wins fewer votes actually actually wins the presidency but that's you know people might disagree about that judgment most in most cases the American Constitution is extremely hard to change and I don't think you're going to get a constitutional amendment because the Electoral College actually favors, you know, it, pro it provides a structural advantage that favors less populous states, and so they're probably not going to favor a constitutional amendment. But there is a cool thing that's going on um, with the Electoral College. I don't know who, th who it was who came up with this idea, but it's actually progressed pretty far. With the, the, the proposal is that states can pass laws that say we are going to authorize our electors to vote for whoever wins the popular vote. Right. But only when states that make up a majority of the Electoral College have signed on to that agreement. Right. So you would essentially have a compact among states where they would say, our votes are going to go to the Electoral College, or are going to go to the popular vote winner. Right. Uh, and I don't know what the number is at this point, but I, it's well over 100 electoral votes that are in states that have passed laws uh, that uh, that sign on to that compact. That actually strikes me as, I mean, it's a little hard, you know, in our polarized politics, it's very hard to get consensus around any kind of institutional reforms because everybody asks, well, is this going to help my side or is it going to help the other side? But I think there is at least, a, to me, a viable road that one could think about that involves pushing for that, that interstate compact where you would essentially say, we're going we're gonna to cast, once we, once we get an agreement that, that involves a majority of the Electoral College vote, we're all going to vote for the popular winner. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Okay, I can hear you. Consequence of what they're doing. Okay, so um, hopefully every heard, everybody heard the question about 
whether there are trends to authoritarianism here, whether there's some kind of, whether there's a conscious strategy pushing, pushing in that direction. I want to be careful about how, how I answer this. First of all, there's just, I mean, we are um, in a situation where there is a lot of fog and a lot of sturm und drang, and it is hard to figure out. You know, it's, we're hit with like daily events, it's hard to figure out um, what's going on. I, but I want to say a couple of thing, things about this, not a complete answer to your question, you know, which is a, a huge multifaceted one with a, with a lot of uncertainty. One is that there isn't a, when I talk about the Republican Party, even though I say that these parties have become stronger, more, cent more national, more unified, it's not a they in a, in a kind of small, cohesive sense, right? So, um, you know, Paul Ryan and Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell, they talk to each other, but they're situated in different places, right? And so they, I'm, I think it's quite clear, I mean, this is part of what I was saying in answer to Cornell's question, that they have different ideas about what they want. Right? Um, and I, I think in some cases, quite different ways. Um, and I certainly, I, I personally don't believe that Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell have much interest in creating an authoritarian regime. Right. I think they want to win politically and they don't think they want to get policy outcomes that they want, but I don't think they have much interest in that. But I'll tell you, but I, you know, I, I think what's going on in the Trump administration, there's a, lot, there's a lot more mystery about that and I think there's a lot more reason for alarm. But the reason maybe this, and this feeds back maybe from something that, that I've been, been exploring here that I think it adds to the reason why, why one ought to really be vigilant and be fearful about this. One reason traditionally why you would say in the United States that you're not going to get that kind of a shift is because we have a separation of power system in which Congress is going to check the presidency. Right? Congress exercises oversight over the presidency. But if you're in the Republican majority in Congress right now, I think your incentives to exercise oversight are very, very limited. Very limited. Right? This president is very, very popular with the base of the Republican Party. Very popular. Right? And you're going to have to face all those voters. And we also know, I mean, in not ancient history, when George W. Bush's popularity tanked, so did congressional Republicans. Right. So they have a big incentive, especially because you know, they're very happy with the Supreme Court nominee. They're going to be very happy when they get to start passing a bunch of legislation and they have a president in there who's going to sign it. Right. They have a lot to gain, not, not just in terms of the, po the popularity of the Republican Party and therefore the popularity of Republicans in Congress. They have a lot to gain in policy terms uh, from, having, uh, from having President Trump in there and not by doing things that are going to actually make him less popular. So that, that is something that I really worry about is that I don't think we should expect very much oversight to come from Congress. And that does, that, that eliminates a really important uh, uh, break we have against authoritarian tendencies. Hi. Um, I have been thinking about how the uh, Donald Trump's campaign promises, over some of them overlap with the goals of the Democratic Party. Um, for instance, uh, infrastructure spending and how Democrats have some incentive to work with him. And I was wondering how you think that will play out in the long term. Uh, I, th I think there is going to be very little policy cooperation. Because um, I don't think you're going to get much of an infrastructure bill. Um, I mean, that is one issue where, in principle, at least, at least they both say that they want to build infrastructure, right? Both the Democrats and the Trump administration say that they want to build infrastructure. If you actually dig down into the policy proposals at all, they are really, really different, like really different. Um, so it's not clear that even, even if you could leave uh, congressional Republicans out of the picture that you, could for that you could find grounds for a deal, but maybe you could. Uh, but this is an example, like, there are some things where, where, that Trump can do unilaterally. He can't do a lot of infrastructure spending unilaterally. He needs Congress to pass a bill. And Democrats don't have a majority in Congress. So, you know, there were people who speculated that, well, maybe, you know, David Brooks wrote a column. David Brooks is, you know, the columnist for the New York Times who's always looking for, like, a flowering of centrism and moderation, the third party that he'd like to see created. And he wrote a column that suggested, oh, you're going to see floating coalitions in Congress, just like the old days, 
right? And so you'll see one group of legislators passing infrastructure and another group passing something on trade and, and so on. I think that is tremendously unlikely. Um, so, I mean, we'll see, we'll see. But I, 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 just, I, I think Trump's appointments so far suggest pretty strongly that in most areas of domestic policy, he is going to pursue a Republican, a very conservative Republican agenda. Right? The people who have come over from the House uh, to, to join uh, the Trump administration, with the exception of the guy who's become Interior Secretary, they're all from the very right part of the, of the very conservative Republican Party. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of reaching across the aisle. My question is, um, what is going to happen in the future with the moderates? Um, you know, we had a handful of people who voted for Jeb Bush, John Kasich, the, the moderates of the Republican Party. There was also, at one point until he shot himself in the foot, there was a 12% interest in the population of seeing Gary Johnson on the debate stage. What is going to happen to those people who might want to see a moderate? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, so I don't think there are that many moderates in the Republican Party anymore. Um, you know, Jacob and I describe this term. It's a fun thing. You write a book and you and you say, well, w there must be a term for that, right? So you know the feeling you get if you're like sitting in a train station and you're sitting, your train is not moving, and the uh, their train next to you is pulling in or pulling out, and you get the sensation that you're moving. It's called vection. That's sen that sensation that you get. There's been a lot, so as the Republican Party has been racing rightward, there's been a lot of effort to sort of treat people who we would have treated as conservatives 10 or 15 years ago as moderates, right? So John Boehner is a great example of that, right? John Boehner, before he said, I can't deal with this mess anymore, I quit, right? Before that, he was seen as kind of like a moderate establishment figure, but he was one of Gingrich's top lieutenants when they started firebombing the house back in back in the early 90s he he you know in the, a story we tell in the book is about him going after the chamber of Boehner being the leader of the effort to go after the chamber of commerce when it was negotiating with the Clinton administration over health care reform right so um, He's on, he only looks like a moderate because all these other people have raised so much further to the right. So I just, you know, and I, I would say if you actually look at, say, their policy positions, you know, John Kasich was also uh, one, of, one, of, uh, one of Gingrich's lieutenants, right? So, um, you, you know, these, these guys, they're, they're, they're moderate not by any standard that's applied in American politics over the last 50 years, but only by comparison with some, some of the other things that are happening. Uh, so one of the things that I worry about a lot it, but, that, but there is this question of like, if, if policies are being pursued that are really, really conservative, where do people go and how do they find, how do they find another place to be? Very hard to get a third party going in the United States. The rules are really, really strongly structured to make. There's a reason why people are constantly complaining about not having a third party and yet there are no th there's no major third party because the rules are really stacked against it. And one thing that I really worry about that's happened in our politics is that once you get to the point where people are in different, they're, they're getting totally different information, totally different information, and they believe totally different things about things for which you can run videotape, right? There's an, there, are, there are still things where there are objective answers, and yet people give totally different answers because they're getting totally different information. And the most people, and this is true, this is not just true of conservatives, right? People want to believe their side. And once you do that, I think we saw this in that, in that campaign, that makes the ability of moderates, who we usually think is the ones who discipline the political system and hold politicians accountable and make sure that things don't get so extreme, well, if they get caught up in this world where they're going to vote for their side, because right, that's what you do, and because they're linked into those networks and they're getting that version of the truth, then it's very, very hard for moderation to survive. So I, I, I'm worried about that. Um, uh, so with the, between the extreme civil unrest since Donald Trump's election and contrasting that with the fact that he's going to be able to potentially set up a lot with stuff such as the Supreme Court and comparing that to, and adding to that the, the stuff you talked about, about 
this being a slow changing process, a historical perspective, I guess my biggest question would be, do you think this is the beginning or do you think come four years from now, we're going to see more of this more radical, more, uh, more, uh, one sided candidates for the next presidency? Or do you think that with the extreme controversy that's come from this election, we're going to be aiming for a more moderate? Uh, I, so I, I don't like to make predictions. Um, I did tell my neighbor that I thought Donald Trump was not going to be president, so I stopped and stopped <laughs> making predictions. Um, but, and, and, I, and also, I just, I think that things are incredibly unpredictable. And I, though I, though I do think, you know, part of the point of the talk is to say, look, something's been happening over a period of time. This didn't just start. This didn't, this didn't just come out of nowhere, right? This, something's been happening over a long period of time um, that has really undercut the legitimacy and support for our core political institutions. And so that is something that people, even though it happens slowly, people should really wake up and pay attention and, tr and try, to, try to sort that out. Um, and I think one of the things that we've learned is that, I don't, that I, I don't think I fully appreciated before is that we thought, okay, well, we have these institutions, the Constitution, you know, that lays things out really clearly and kind of structures our politics. And I do think, I, I argued today, right, that the structure of the Constitution really matters. But it turns out that norms really matter a lot too. Like what people think it's okay to do. And some of the radical changes that have taken place in American politics, and again, I mean, I really do think New Gingrich uh, was, a was a political genius, right? He figured out that you, there was actually enormous capacity for disruption once you stopped respecting those norms. Right? It turned out you could win permanent control, virtu vir well, decades and decades of control over the Supreme Court by breaking a norm about whether or not you were going to consider an appoint a, a nominee from the other from the other party's president. Right? So. Um, so it turns out these, I think these institutions are more fragile than we realize. Uh, and and that, is some, that is something to be concerned about. On the other hand, I would say it is, um, it, it, to me at least, it suggests that there may be limits to this, that uh, President Trump's approval ratings are astonishingly low for somebody who is two weeks into his presidency. I mean, even after, you know, after in 2000, where people were, you know, people were pretty fired up and pretty divided after uh, the 2000 election and Bush v. Gore and all that. Uh, and, you know, the week after, after Bush uh, became president, his approval rating was in the low 60s. You know, Trump's is in the low 40s. Right? There's a lot of pushback. You know, there are a lot of people, and there are a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump at the same time that they thought he wasn't qualified to be president. Right, so, uh, but I'm not going to make a prediction. Thank you. Um, hello. You spoke about how, for the past 30 years, the uh, Republican Party, between the right-wing media and Newt Gingrich's strategy, has kind of moved more and more to the right and kind of adopted this burn the house down strategy to try and get elected. My question is, is there any way back, and would there be any incentive to come back, or is it just going to be this from now on because it's a winning strategy? That's a great question. Um, it involves a prediction, so I'm not going to say. But um, uh, so, th what would make what would make them give up on the strategy would be if it weren't if it was not politically successful. Right. So I so I think watching um, watching the president's approval ratings is really important for thinking about you know the political incentives change if it turns out not to be a winning strategy. So I think, I think that, is, that is profoundly important. My fear about this is I just think it's a lot easier to tear things down than it is to build them up. You know, I think you could say that about, I mean, it's, it's a fear not just about the politics that we're talking about, about um, domestically, but I, you know, a lot, there are a lot of things going on internationally right now that involve uh, the Trump administration. And here's an area where he actually has a lot more room to run than he does in domestic policy. There are a lot of efforts that he's engaged in, that Bannon is engaged in, that involve disrupting arrangements that have been in place and taken for granted for decades. Uh, and I just feel like it's, it's a lot easier to break, you know, 
to break the vase than it is to glue it back together. Um, it, it is, you know, w how do you restore faith in government when Americans overwhelmingly are disgusted by it? You know, that, I think that is a deep, deep challenge. But to me, to me, the starting point would have to be that these kinds of political strategies that involve trashing the place, that, that people see that you pay a political price for doing that. Um, and that has not been true enough over the last quarter century, but you know, maybe the future will be better. Very interesting conversation tonight and a, a perfect kickoff for our, our uh, series of events on the Trump administration, which, by the way, be continue next Monday. We have two events, one at noon in the Foley Institute and one 4.30 here uh, looking at Trump and the, and the media. So that should be fascinating as well. But we've had a lot to chew on tonight. I have a, a couple of small tokens of our appreciation to, to give to uh, Professor Pearson. We, uh, we give our distinguished lecturers a, a, a plaque, State of Washington. Thank you. Let me thank you all for coming out tonight and uh, thank our, our, our speaker one more time. <laughs>